Okay, let's begin section two, discrete random variables. Okay, uh, in this chapter, our primary goal is to study the claim frequency, that is the number of claims for uh, some policies. Uh, so obviously that means uh, the focus from the mathematical point of view uh, will be discrete random variables. So that's why, you know, in this section, we study some important tools which we can utilize to, to study discrete random variables. First is the definition. So let X be a random variable defined on some given probability space. X is called a discrete random variable if, if the possible values X can take is discrete. Okay, so here I put has up to countably many elements. Okay. Uh, so a discrete random variable is uniquely determined by its probability function because uh, X can take only uh, countably many elements. So I can discuss for each and every one of them. And uh, the probability is called uh, the probability function. So this is not CDF, okay? So this actually takes equality, okay? Uh, in the definition of CDF is when we define CDF is less than or equal to, here we have exactly equality, okay? And uh, that only works for discrete, okay? For continuous, we don't talk about uh, equality. So an uh, immediate result is that if we want to know the CDF, right, because, you know, it's less than, right? So we need to uh, figure out what y's it's uh, less than or equal to x, and we need to sum up all of them. So that's how we get uh, uh, CDF from the probability function. Okay, uh, with the examples, that's a lot easier to understand. So we have a CRM2, which comes from the general result from the uh, function part. So here we have a function small f, which we call it a probability function if, and uh, by the way, whenever we talk about a probability function, that is for a discrete. And then variable. Okay, uh, we do not use probability function for continuous random variable. So this f must be between zero and one because it's a probability. And when we sum up over all the possible values of x, it must be one. Right? That's because uh, in the end, we know the full set of all scenarios. Right? So which means one of them must happen. One of them must happen. That means the summation must be one. Okay. So uh, in a more concrete setup, let's say the value of this random variable can take n possible values, small x1 all the way to small xn, okay? n is a positive integer, which can be infinity if you want. Uh, let's say we order them, okay? We can always order them because they are numbers, okay? And we, 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 we actually assume uh, x1 is strictly less than x2 because if they coincide, you can merge, you know, two values. So this uh, never a possibility that some of x's will be equal. You know, it's it's not possible. You know, even if they are equal, you can, can you can uh, you can merge them together so that they are not equal. Okay. So let pi be the uh, so basically, what I put is pi is the probability for x equals small xi. So it must be between zero and one. And when I add up from one to n is one. So that's the uh, example five. It's something uh, we will see a lot in the applications. So next we define moments. What is moments, right? So we already know expected value. Expected value is the first moment. So we can generalize this idea easily to the nth moment, right? When n is one is expected value or expectation or mean or average, whatever you want to call it, uh, the definition is straightforward. Right? When you're going to calculate the expected value of xn, you consider the value raised to power to xn times the corresponding probability function, then that's it. That's how you calculate the, uh, the expectation. Because in general, how do you, how do you let x be a, of course here we only consider discrete random variables, okay? So let g be any function. So what I do is go from one to n g of xi times pi, right? Using our previous notation, pi is the probability that x equals xi. So that's how we get to the expectation. 
for a function of random variable, okay? So g can be any function. So here g is power function, right? Uh, once we have the law moment, law moment, which means we only take the power term, we do not minus the uh, mean part. If you take the subtraction from the uh, expectation, so mu x is the expectation of, of x, that's our notation. Uh, what do we get is central moment. So here we have central moment, here we have law moment. The difference is whether we subtract the mean. When we subtract the mean, what we get is the central moment. Uh, we can also define central moment all the way to any, any positive number if we can. Uh, of course, sometimes, you know, if, if n is too big, you may get uh, positive infinity. And uh, uh, we don't talk about one because when n is one, central limit obviously is zero, right? Because x minus mu x, right? So uh, expectation is a linear operator. You can take it out. So, so there's no point of talking about the first central moment. Uh, the second central moment, however, is very, very important. That is the variance, okay? And we use sigma to the uh, sigma square to denote the variance, okay? Uh, by the way, as you can see, uh, my personal uh, preference is to uh, use the subscript to denote the corresponding random variable. And sometimes if there's no confusion, if you only have one random variable, you may uh, ignore this subscript, simply write mu or sigma square. And sigma is the so-called standard deviation, okay? Uh, this formula is very straightforward. All you need to do is to open up the square bracket, right? Okay, next, moment generating function. Uh, MGF is defined as the expectation of exponential of Tx. So that is the definition. Uh, this is uh, quite useful in actuarial science because um, for, for applications, moment generating function is slightly easier, okay? Uh, although from the most general uh, concept, um, people should or we should prefer uh, the characteristic function over the MGF. Uh, the reason is because MGF can blow up. So it's possible that uh, uh, it's positive infinity because you are considering an exponential function. And when you draw the exponential, it looks like this. Right, so if x is somehow um, you know heavily tailed, this can easily be infinity, right? Because exponential already grows very very quickly, right? It grows much much faster than the linear function. So uh, in combining them, if you have a positive random variable x which has very fat tails, this could be just the infinity. If you have infinity, there's nothing we can use, you know, to to work with. However, if you consider the, char the characteristic function, it's always well-defined, okay? Uh, but again, for us, we, we, uh, we rely more on applications, so anything that helps us, you know, it's somehow more beneficial. That's why in actual science, uh, people actually use MGF more, a lot more than the characteristic function, okay? Uh, according to what I just gave you for the general definition of, of here, so you can quickly calculate uh, the MGF, right? All you need to do is to plug in the corresponding values times the corresponding probability. So that's the, uh, how you get MGF, okay? So that's why, you know, I have a quick note here. Uh, in, in the general form, we define MGF for any real number T. So MGF, again, you know, this is a function of T not x, okay? Uh, because when you take expectation, x goes away. It becomes a function of t, and t takes real values. So it's a standard function from real numbers to real numbers. So it maps from real numbers to real numbers, okay? Uh, of course, as, as I just mentioned, uh, sometimes your MGF may be infinity. So we may need to restrict t to a smaller set of real numbers, okay, instead of everything. So uh, this slide is really important. So the reason why we introduce MGF is because it can 
quickly help us calculate the moments to any degree. Okay, uh, I give you this result. Okay, it's very, very straightforward to verify. Again, you know, that is from the definition. Okay, uh, assume it is differentiable with respect to t and assume that you can, uh, you can switch the order because when we differentiate, so I put a prime on this as the uh, superscript to denote the uh, derivative. Assume I can switch the order, which means um, technically speaking, I should take exploitation first and then uh, let, me, let me write it down. So I differentiate, you know, on the outside, right? So I take expectation first and then I differentiate. Assume that I can switch the order, okay? Uh, most of the times we do, we can, okay? So I differentiate first and then I take expectation. The inside part is easy. Okay? Remember, MGF is a function of T and when we differentiate, okay, I, I implicitly say we differentiate with respect to T, not X, okay? So which means we treat X as constant. So X goes from TX, right? Because X is a constant, T is the argument or T is the, uh, is the, um, uh, the, the argument we want to differentiate with respect with. So in this case, right, we easily get this result, okay? So uh, if I take t to be zero, if I take t to be zero, exponential of zero is one, right? So it becomes the expected value of x, right? So again, I can differentiate again, then I get the second derivative of mgf, and then I get x squared in front. Still, I want to evaluate at t equals zero, then I get the second law moment. Okay, actually I can repeat, right? It's easy to see that I can quickly repeat. I differentiate n times. This is the nth derivative of the MGF, okay? So I get this form and if I evaluate t at zero, I get nothing but the nth law moment. So if you know the MGF and uh, it is in a nice form, by nice, I mean it's easy to differentiate, we can quickly calculate the moments, right? It saves us the time to do the summation work. And this could be a lot uh, if your n goes from zero to positive infinity, right? So this is a, a neat formula to, uh, to help us to calculate the moments, okay? Of course, from here, you can quickly get the variance, right? So uh, this result, so those results are really, really helpful in, in actual applications. And uh, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, discrete random variable, we can even discuss something uh, even easier. That's what we call the probability generating function. Uh, we only have this definition for discrete random variable. MGF is also defined for continuous random variable as well, uh, but here you only define it for discrete. As we will see, uh, to define PGF, probability generating function, uh, you actually need a non-negative random variables, which takes only non-negative integer values, which means it will be zero, one, two, all the way to infinity, or it ends somewhere. It's, 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 it's quite limited, right? But it works for us because in this chapter, we study claim frequency. Claim frequency is exactly non-negative integer value, right? So uh, at least for this chapter, it's enough. So we define PGF as the expectation of this power form, t to the power of x, okay? Uh, this is, well, you can think this as a special form of, uh, of, of PGF, uh, of, of MGF, right? So there's a natural connection, right? It is very obvious that right, you have this form, right? So uh, in order to, uh, to get MGF from PGF, you just need to take T to be exponential of T and vice versa. If you have MGF, you want to get PGF, you just need to take log T, right? So that's, that's very straightforward, right? 
And uh, uh, the reason why we need PDF is that it gives us a nice result here. This is uh, very, very important uh, because when we have discrete random variables, the most important information is probability function. Right? And according to this result, that result inside the box, uh, from PGF, we can differentiate and uh, to, uh, to get the probability function, okay? But there is a n factorial, okay? n factorial is defined as n times n minus one times n minus two all the way to one, okay? Uh, here we only talk about uh, non-negative uh, integers and um, if you have zero, zero factorial is one. Okay, so we set that to be one. So uh, if you want to know why, well, it's straightforward, right? You just differentiate, you just differentiate from here and then you will see the result, right? Uh, the, the, the thing you need to uh, make sure is it's, it is also a function of t. When you differentiate, you treat x as a constant, right? So if you want to differentiate this with respect to t, not x, you get x times t2, right? So, <clears throat> and uh, we, we have zero to any power as one, right? As long as it's not zero, so. So that's why we, we uh, when we differentiate, first of all, you get x, and when you differentiate the second time, what you get is x minus one, right? The third time you get x minus two, x minus three, and so on. So that's why uh, we do have the factorial. So it's, it's, it's straightforward to, to verify, right? Uh, you can use mathematical induction if you want, right? But you know, it's, it's, it's really uh, straightforward to verify this result. And um, uh, sometimes it's, it's very helpful to, to, to apply this uh, to calculate the probability function, okay? So it's, it's a very nice tool, okay? Keep in mind uh, of, of the uh, use of this tool. Uh, finally, we, we quickly mention continuous random variables. Um, uh, for chapter one, it's, it's really, really not important because uh, this is the subject of the next chapter. Uh, I, I quickly mentioned, okay, uh, for continuous random variables, uh, we assume there exists a function small f such that the CDF can be expressed as an integral from negative infinity to x with, with, uh, of this fu small function f, okay? So that is somehow, you know, you can think that is an assumption. We assume there exists such function. And this small f is called probability density function, or sometimes people just call it density function, okay? Uh, according to the fundamental theory of calculus, if you have such an uh, expression, and when you differentiate with respect to small x, you get small f, right? So that's the derivative of, of big F. So you can think PDF as the first derivative of CDF if X is a continuous random variable, okay? So obviously we need this to be non-negative, otherwise uh, the CDF can be decreasing, right? Because CDF is always you know, increasing, or at least non-decreasing. So your PDF must be um, non-negative as well. Uh, because when you take x to positive infinity, you get a one. So you have this additional uh, information. Remember, for the discrete case, what do we have? We have this, right? And we, we, all, we also know, if you, uh, if you know the actual definition of a lemma integral, an integral is nothing but a limit of summation, right? So those two uh, properties, they, they, they correspond to each other, okay? Uh, I think uh, that's, that's enough for this section. We will continue uh, in the next uh, video for section three.